Okay, so, uh, welcome to this next video in which we are talking about the pore of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So in this video, what I want to now talk about is the open channel blockers of uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Okay, so, what do I mean by an open channel blocker? Well, basically, uh, what we know happens if, to draw a very simple diagram, we know that the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor starts off closed, okay? So here it is in the closed conformation, sitting in the phospholipid bi there. Now, when acetylcholine binds, so in comes acetylcholine, ACH, what's going to happen is that the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor is going to open, okay? And it's going to allow sodium ions to move uh, through the channel into uh, the inside of the cell. Okay, now, we've discussed in previous videos uh, drugs known as competitive antagonists, okay? So an example, a famous example, was alpha bungara toxins. So we'll talk about this. A competitive antagonist. Okay, so there was a drug known as alpha bungara toxin, which was a competitive antagonist of uh, the uh, skeletal muscle type of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, alpha bungara toxin, okay? And what this did was it bound to the same site on the extracellular domain as acetylcholine. So um, if I draw the acetylcholine binding here, so here are the little acetylcholine molecules, and we know two acetylcholines bind uh, to the uh, skeletal muscle form of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, okay? Uh, then basically what alpha bungara toxin does is it binds to that same place as acetylcholine. It binds in the acetylcholine binding site and does not trigger the receptor to open. So let's show this happening. So this is with the addition of alpha bungara toxin, BGTX for short. Then what we're going to get is, if this is the plasma membrane here, here's our uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor still closed, but now you've got alpha bungarotoxin bound there, and we'll show alpha bungarotoxin in blue. Okay, so then when you release acetylcholine onto this nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, the acetylcholine can't bind to the receptor because the alpha bungarotoxin is sitting in its seat effectively. Uh, so this means that um, the acetylcholine is ineffective acting on the uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor because its binding site is, is already occupied, basically. So competitive antagonists are things which bind to the site where the ligands should bind and do not activate the receptor. So they bind but don't activate and just block the uh, receptor uh, from having the ligand bind to it. And alpha bungarotoxin is an example of uh, such a competitive antagonist for the neuromuscular junction form of the acetylcholine receptor. Okay, now, what we're going to talk about now are open channel blockers. Okay, so open channel blockers. And these are often also referred to as non-competitive inhibitors, or maybe even non-competitive antagonists. Open channel blockers, which are non-competitive antagonists or inhibitors. Really, they should be referred to as non-competitive inhibitors rather than antagonists. Antagonist strictly means it will bind to the binding site and stop something else, the activator binding. So antagonists don't inhibit things. Instead, they block the activation of them, okay? Whereas this drug is actually going to inhibit uh, the channel. So what an open channel blocker is going to do is um, when uh, the acetylcholine receptor binds, it's going to go in there, into the pore. It's going to bind to the open channel here, okay? And it's going to block that channel. So, this has absolutely nothing to do with the mechanism by which alpha bungarotoxin blocked the activity of these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. This is working in a very different way. This allows the acetylcholine to bind to the receptor, but when the receptor opens, it then goes into the channel and blocks it. 
Okay, so we are now going to look at drugs which go into the pore of uh, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor when it's open and block it. Okay, and what seems to happen is all of these open channel blockers, they seem to interact with a specific portion of the uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, which I'll show you on my picture. They interact with this hydrophobic girdle or hydrophobic patch here. So this ring of uh, leucine amino acids. So basically what seems to happen is when the acetylcholine binds, these leucines are to some degree moved out of the way to open up the pore for ions to move through more so that uh, they do not shut the channel anymore. Okay. But what seems to happen, but they're not removed completely from the pore, they're just moved out of the way slightly, they're moved backwards a little bit to open the pore wider uh, and allow ions to move through. What's going to happen is the drug is going to come through and get caught in this hydrophobic patch because it's still, these leucines are still sticking out into the, uh, into the channel, it's just it's not quite as invasive or obstructive as it is when you're in the closed state. It's, on a, it's got a big enough gap in between the leucine residues that ions can actually move through uh, the middle. So what the drug does is it comes in and gets caught in this hydrophobic patch and then ends up blocking the entire channel and blocking all the ion movement through. So let's see some examples of these uh, open channel blockers of nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Okay, so the first one is a drug uh, that is quite famous. It's chlorpromazine, okay? And chlorpromazine is a drug that is famous for its antipsychotic effects. So this drug is used as an antipsychotic, okay? And if you actually look, uh, if you know anything about this drug, you'll know that it's an a, it's a sorry, it's a typical antipsychotic. It's a very old antipsychotic. And uh, although we think that the reason uh, it works as an antipsychotic is that it uh, binds to and antagonizes the D2 receptors in the striatum. Um, this uh, drug also interacts with a huge number of other receptors and one of its uh, functions is that it will act as an open channel blocker of nicotinic acetylcholine receptors and it's also often referred to as CPZ. So, let me show you the structure of chlorpromazine, just to add a bit of interest. Okay, so the structure of chlorpromazine is quite pretty. So you have two benzene rings, so here's one benzene ring here, and I'll draw the skeletal structure to make it easier. So here's one benzene ring, okay, then you have a sulfur atom here, and a nitrogen atom here, and then you link this up to another benzene ring, so this is beautifully symmetric at the moment. So here's another benzene ring. And then you um, add on down here a little alkyl chain. So you have this free carbon chain, one, two, three. And then off it, you then have a nitrogen atom here, which then has two methyl groups stuck off it. Okay, so you've got three carbons in the middle here, one, two, three. And each of these carbons will have two hydrogens coming off it. But because we're drawing a skeletal structure, you don't show those. So it's just implicitly assumed that they have hydrogens coming off. So you have three methylene groups in between, and then this nitrogen on the end with two methyl groups coming off. Okay, and then to ruin the beautiful symmetry, you then stick a chlorine on there. And you needed to have a chlorine somewhere, otherwise where was the chlor in the name? So this is the structure of chlorpromazine. And it, as I say, it's used as an antipsychotic clinically, uh, but experimentally it can be used as an open channel blocker of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Okay, so... Let's see some more uh, open channel blockers of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So the next one we'll see, which I think we can probably squeeze it in here, is a drug known as methyl triphenyl phosphonium. Okay, methyl triphenyl phosphonium. And as you'll see, this is an ion. So usually, this will have to have a counter ion. In fact, sorry, not usually. It will have to have a counter ion. Although the counter ion is not important for us uh, with regards to its function. Okay, so the methyl triphenyl uh, phosphonium is a cation, basically. And it's the cation that will be functional 
but if you were actually to uh, you know buy a compound that's going to produce the methyl triphenyl phosphonium cation and you maybe buy something like methyl triphenyl uh, phosphonium bromide okay so but the portion that's actually active uh, pharmacologically active is the methyl triphenyl phosphonium cation so let me show you the structure of this so, uh, what you basically have is a phosphorus atom at the centre, that's the phosphonium in the name, and then it should be pretty obvious. We've got a methyl group coming off this phosphorus atom, so here's a methyl group, and then triphenyl. Well, phenyl means benzene, so basically you've got three benzene rings coming off this phosphorus atom, so I'll just denote these by hexagons with circles in the middle. So here are these three benzene rings coming off our phosphorus atom at the centre in our methyl triphenyl phosphonium cation. Okay, right. And now, this is the thing. Phosphorus should have free bonds. So it's got one spare electron that it needs to pair up. And in fact, what's going to happen is it's going to lose that electron to maybe some uh, other chemical species, such as a halogen. And remember, halogens such as bromine, they have seven outer shell electrons. So they want to gain one more, so they're going to take this free electron of the phosphorus atom that the phosphorus wants to get rid of because it really wants five bonds. Uh, and if it can't get it, it would rather just get rid of that electron. So it gives this electron away to this bromine, sorry, this bromine atom here, gives the bromine a negative charge, so it's now a bromide ion. And the phosphorus atom then gets a positive charge. So this here is the methyl triphenyl phosphonium cation. And this basically uh, is capable of going down our pore, just like a sodium arm would, and then getting stuck at the hydrophobic girdle uh, and blocking the entire uh, channel, basically. Okay, so the methyl triphenyl phosphonium cation is another example of an open channel uh, blocker of uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And then finally, we have another drug known as QX222, okay, which is a modified version of lidocaine, which we know is a open channel blocker of the sodium channel. However, this is also functions as an open channel blocker of nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So, QX222. Um, so, the structure of QX222 is that you start off with a benzene ring over here, okay, and then off this benzene ring, and I'll just put the ring there, you then have two methyl groups, okay, one here and one here. You then have an amide group, so here's the amide group coming off in between the two, like so. And then, off this amide group, you then have a methylene group leading onto a nitrogen which has got three ethyl groups coming off. So here's a nitrogen, and then what you're going to have is these three ethyl groups, which I'll draw in full out. So here's an ethyl group. I'll abbreviate the methyl group on the end to that. Here's another ethyl group coming off here. And finally, here's another ethyl group coming off here. Now that nitrogen has one too many bonds, and basically, in one of these three bonds, it's donated both electrons, and when it does that, what happens is effectively it gives one of the electrons up to the other chemical species. So it's given up one of its electrons to these carbons, and that gives the nitrogen a positive charge. Okay, so this is the structure of uh, QX222. Um, right, so again, this structure has a positive charge here. So What's going to happen is it's going to go through the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor thinking it's just a normal sodium ion and then it's going to get stuck at the hydrophobic girdle and it's going to totally block the channel, occluding all uh, ion movement through that channel. So these can be used as open channel blockers or non-competitive inhibitors of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Okay, so in the next video, we'll continue on discussing the pore of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, and we'll look at substituted cysteine accessibility methods um, for studying which residues are uh, lining the pore of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor.